All right, we are live. So, Vallabh and Aditya, you can go ahead. <coughs> yes, sir. Okay, so hello everyone. Today, today we will be discussing about the overview of cooperative autonomy in underwater environments. So, a few days back, we read a paper in this uh, in this area, and the ideas that were presented there are uh, presented in this presentation. So, let's get started. Uh, can you move to the next slide? Yes. So, first we'll compare the traditional versus modern approach to surveillance. Uh, let's get started with traditional surveillance approach. So. Yes. So for a long time, surveillance of underwater environment has been done using manned vessels with a set of some sensors on them. This usually makes the surveillance operations quite expensive in terms of resources used and the cost incurred in building them. Apart from the cost, there are uh, several other dangers present for the human operators if they are manned uh, due to the nature of work, leave alone the human errors, which can be very costly. Now uh, we'll discuss the modern approach. Yes, next. So the modern approach uh, proposes a network of small, low-powered mobile robots. Uh, this network could uh, collaboratively work together to form an internet network. These uh, these small unmanned robots would work autonomously and thus would keep humans from the surveillance area. And the main features of these uh, uh, robots, small robots, would be that, that they would be scalable, adaptable, reliable, and robust. So now let's discuss the challenges. Can you? Yeah. So this uh, this uh, robot, uh, even though they promise a better future in the field of underwater exploration, there are certain challenges that needs to be that needs to be solved. So we'll 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 see the challenges. Can you go to the next. Yeah. So underwater environment is quite harsh and dynamic. It is quite uncertain that it changes greatly with time. Yeah. Next. Yeah, here high pressure and corrosive effects. Salinity of seawater brings in the corrosive effects, and the huge water columns above the AUV will create great pressure on it. Uh, so these limitations, uh, this limits the type of material to be used and the size of the robot. Next, yes, uh, lack of standard softwares. So the network that I mentioned in the previous slide, the, it may contain heterogeneous platforms, which means that. There will be several nodes, there will be several robots, but each one of them will have different capabilities. Now, to integrate them together on a single platform, uh, there is a lack of standard software. Some progress has been achieved by ROS, Robot Operating System, and a software named Moose IVP, which is developed by MIT. But there are still certain challenges to be uh, solved for standardizing the hardware of the robots. Yes. Uh, okay, next, yeah. the limitations in the mode of communication and data transfer. So now we are going to work in underwater environment. So the major problem here is that electromagnetic waves cannot be used for the mode of communication due to the attenuation of the signal underwater. We are left only with uh, acoustic waves, sound waves, through which we can uh, communicate with other nodes. The problem that lies here is uh, it limits the speed of data transfer as well as the transmission bandwidth. Also, there are several other problems related to the network, uh, the, the security, the data security that we are passing. The, the data that we are transmitting might be hacked by someone. It is possible due to the small bandwidth. And also, yes, limitations due to the use of battery. Since we are in the underwater environment, uh, the oxygen is not present in free gaseous form. So the traditional combustion engines are uh, cannot be used here. And we are left only with the batteries. So uh, the endurance of the the vehicle reduces due to the use of batteries. And next, yes, GPS uh, underwater in underwater environment GPS is not available. So uh, localization becomes a big problem here. These are certain challenges that uh, will be occurred in underwater environments. Yes. So let's let's move to the surveillance network architecture. So here we will discuss about the three phases which surveillance takes place. So let's see the first phase. First phase is the patrolling or area search. So in this phase, the robotic nodes would monitor an area which has been assigned to them. In case of MCM, mine uh, countermeasure operations, they would typically focus on a stationary area, a fixed area. Uh, while in case of ASW operations, anti-submarine warfare operations, they would uh, 
be doing more kind of, more of a patrolling kind of work the objective of this phase is to uh, guarantee a desired uh, probability of detection so they will try to detect an object in this phase uh, next next we we'll move to the next phase yes then this nodes move to the phase 2 where the detections that were done in phase 1 are analyzed and tentative targets uh, are identified so then after that uh, we move to the next phase the the last phase this is the neutralizing uh, neutralizing phase so uh, in we here in this phase we'll try to neutralize the target that were identified in case of mcm operations mine counter major operations uh, the the robots would try to defuse the bomb or in case of asw anti submarine warfare operations they would try to maneuver themselves in such a manner to get uh, to get more information from the target yes so next we'll see the surveillance network architecture uh, in terms of the common characteristics that each node will possess so there will be several nodes working in our network and each network each each of those uh, node in the network will have certain common characteristics we will discuss them here so there will be several nodes collaborating with each other as well as uh, communicating with the command center and uh, the common characteristics uh, we will we'll discuss them so robot executive layer in the, you can see in the diagram towards the left uh, it acts as an interface uh, with the robot hardware sensors and actuators data from the sensors is provided to the next layer the signal processing layer so uh, in the signal processing layer the data that was sent is uh, processed uh, the data will contain uh, noise so that noise will be filtered here and uh, contacts will be detected so uh, in in surveillance paradigm uh, contact contacts means the we have detected some object so those contacts will be then passed Uh, to the next module the tracking and data fusion module here uh, target tracks are created so what do we mean by target tracks target tracks are uh, the prediction of the future of the target like how and where it will be so that is done using tracks and sometimes what happens is that we are having since we are having a collaborative network each each node will uh, each node will collect the data of that particular point in different uh, way so that uh, different uh, the data from different nodes will be fused together to get uh, to get more reliable uh, yes yes uh ha so so uh, yeah i was discussing about the collaborative yeah so the data from different uh, nodes will be fused together to get a more reliable estimate of the track so those generated tracks will be uh, passed on to the classification module and it has a world model with it so world model means the map of the environment so with the tracks and this world model it will select from that set of tracks uh, which one would likely most likely lead to the main target so the output of this uh, dclt layer the three the three blocks that we discussed signal processing tracking and data fusion and classification so this is called the dclt layer the output of the dclt layer is passed to the autonomy engine and uh, along with the mission objectives so uh, this information is passed to the autonomy engine and the uh, the autonomy engine with the help of some algorithms it will replan its strategies to achieve mission goals so it will send certain decisions to the uh, robot executive layer where actuators are present and then the actuators will perform those actions and these are the this is the common architecture in every node that is present in the network so uh, now i would ask vallab to go ahead and uh, one second before we proceed further i want to come back to the presentation vallab once okay so this is like a high level overview of how a operation which is involving multiple robots would work correct yes yes so right so can we come back to classification what what exactly do we mean by classification so we are having uh, multiple tracks uh, from the previous uh, layer the tracking and data fusion layer there uh, certain tracks will be created 
so classification uh, module it will have a world model like it will have an environment the map of the environment so mm. with the help of that it will uh, we are having multiple tracks so from that tracks one particular track will be chosen like this will most likely lead to the main target so that ah, is done. okay so you are trying to eliminate the other tracks which may be ah, yes. of us yes sir okay so now the question then becomes why would we have multiple tracks what might be the reasons why we would have multiple tracks for the same underwater target uh, i think this is due to the the data fusion from uh, we are getting information from multiple nodes so okay. so we are having different perspective about the same thing uh, right so so there Correct. might be because so there, multiple people are observing it from different perspectives you think there are multiple tracks but can there be any other reasons also why multiple tracks might exist because this detection usually happens in the acoustic medium can that lead to some problems which may cause multiple tracks to be present other other thing may be the noise uh, the, the filtered noise the noise that is not filtered maybe due to that i'm not quite sure or sure about this but okay i think the other thing which i was trying to kind of get you to answer was that uh, when you have acoustic mediums you are basically detecting using a sending a ping out or and then trying to listen back to the echo and if you have multiple what you call surfaces from which the echo is coming back it may lead to a localization of the object in different bearings and different ranges Okay. depending on where the echo is coming from where the reflection is coming from you will perceive it as if the target is in that direction so for the same underwater target you may have multiple bearings and multiple ranges being detected at once depending on where you are located okay right so out of all of those you might want to eliminate all the ones which are actually coming directly from the echo or to be if your algorithm should be able to try to understand that these things are coming from an echo so therefore the target is not actually there but is in a reflective environment is somewhere else hmm yes sir right yes. so those multiple tracks are specifically notoriously problematic for underwater environments you don't see this problem occur so much in on land vehicles because you see you have a camera or a lidar and you can really detect precisely where a pedestrian is when you're driving an autonomous car whereas in underwater the system becomes much more challenging so even if let's say you have one target but you have reflections off of three different surfaces you will come up with three different range and bearing measurements now imagine if we have multiple vehicles in an environment with multiple reflective surfaces then you are really yeah it really becomes a challenging problem so the classification step there is really a quite a challenging aspect which still is uh, being looked at in very much in detail and has a lot of applications in uh, different sector particularly okay yes, all right let's go forward uh, any other yes. questions yes sir. so i didn't understand why is a world model required so can you explain the part of the like where world model is used? uh it it is like a map of the environment so with the help so of if, it, if the robot goes in an unmapped environment will will it not work properly or how, uh, the, can it only survey in a, in a place that it has already known and cannot be used in unknown places does it mean that uh, no it's not like that uh, having a map of environment will will help it to eliminate other tracks that we told there will be multiple tracks generated from the previous layer and then other tracks which are not relevant will be eliminated and the final track will be passed to the next layer and for that the world model is required okay i i think i'll try to answer this a little bit so the idea there is that whenever you are doing a surveillance operation you definitely don't know some information but you definitely do know some other information right so you know some information you want to collect more information so the world map represents accumulative 
uh, combination of all the information from all the robotic nodes, which is transferred back to the command center, where you're integrating it and trying to find out what is the current location of the obstacles, where are the features located in an unknown territory. And it can be an incomplete map to oh, begin okay. with. Yeah, okay. Right. So it, it also falls into the paradigm of SLAM, and I think your kind of question is hinting towards that. Oh, yes, sir. Right. So SLAM standing for simultaneous localization and mapping, which means that when you're trying to survey an uncertain environment, you don't know what the map looks like. But as you start exploring, you're building a map, and you're trying to place where exactly you're located in the map at any particular time and step. Yes, so the world map is kind of helping towards that. So it's not an existing map which is complete in all sense. Oh, okay. And it may be evolving over time as well. Okay, okay. Okay. All right, any other questions? All right, I think Malab, you can go ahead. Uh, yeah, so uh, we uh, already discussed uh, the surveillance network architecture, and uh, now we will see some uh, control app, uh, approaches for the uh, AUVs. So the first approach uh, here is the uh, mission mod sorry, model driven approach. Uh, in this approach, the uh, AUV is provided with the uh, world model beforehand. So uh, and here the objectives of the mission are clearly specified uh, to the AUV and it will carry out the tasks uh, based on these uh, for these objectives and uh, a pre-programmed scripted sequences of actions will also be provided uh, and in, in which according to which the AUV will carry out the tasks of the mission and uh, this type of uh, approach is useful in environments uh, where the there is some uncertainty in the uh, environment and uh, the actions being scripted here ensure that uh, there is high level of predictability but uh, this comes at the cost of low flexibility uh, in the sense that uh, once the mission is started the robot does not modify its actions in response to the data it is collecting uh, so this approach leads to uh, sort of multi-phase missions where the data is collected then it is processed and then for the subsequent missions uh, will be planned and uh, for the missions will be carried out. Uh, and ah, there are some examples of this uh, application. Uh, one is the MCM application that Aditya discussed. So in this also, uh, there are multiple phases. Uh, there will be a detection phase, a classification phase, identification and, and mine neutralization phase. And another is the hydrothermal vent prospecting. Uh, this is uh, related to uh, research of the deep water regions where water is heated due to geothermal causes and so on. So uh, scientists might want to place some equipment uh, at those places and a robot will be navigating to those regions, placing the equipment and uh, which will do subsequent measurements. Uh, so another type of uh, approach is the data driven approach. Uh, in this approach, uh, which is it is more commonly nowadays, and uh, in this approach, the robot is actions are adaptive in nature. Uh, what this means is that uh, the the data that it is collecting uh, it, that influences the actions of the robots. Uh, yeah, and uh, this can be seen as an instance of sensor management. So what this means is that each robot is the looked at as a sensor and our goal is to explore the environment in the most effective way by managing these sensors uh, and gaining more information uh, the problem of management of these sensors uh, is formulated as a stochastic control problem so uh, this stochastic control problem will have a cost function uh, which will which will be composed of two parts like a deterministic part and a stochastic part so this deterministic part will uh, involve costs related to, say, the battery usage, uh, which are so going from point A to point B, uh, how much battery will be used. So that we can know for, uh, from the design of the UV. 
uh, so that is deterministic and the stochastic will involve uh, something like uh, the uncertainty uh, that from going from point a to point b uh, if the uncertainty of our prediction about the target location is say increasing so that is a cost for us so that is another way to look at well uh, maybe we can pause for here a minute and can we go back to the idea of sensor management what does it really mean uh so like, i understand it as that uh uh our goal will be uh, to gain the uh, information about the environment so for that we are seeing each of the robots as a sensor and we will placing them in uh in appropriate ways so that uh, or rather controlling them in the most appropriate way so that uh, Our knowledge about the environment increases in the best possible way. Can we think of any example where this might be relevant? Uh, so, like uh, they do this uh, water column surveys. So, uh, uh, and also like uh, these uh, some uh, some oceanographic uh, data studies. So they might want to. Uh, take multiple observations uh, at the same time so that uh, like the, the region to explore is uh, huge so one robot cannot be used and um, we are using multiple robots then uh, these robots should uh, what can say um, move in such a way that uh, you are getting most out of it uh, okay i'll make my question a little more specific specifically from the point of view that these robots are a heterogeneous set of robots which means that they are not all similar right mm -hmm. they are not identical robots they are all different robots equipped with different sensors and different capabilities mm -hmm. uh, how would that form a part of the sensor management yeah so like uh, for some particular application like uh, it could even be uh, detecting of mines or something so uh, Um, uh, some robots were being uh, more specialized with the task of say classification so uh, that uh, these uh, there will be a detection step and then uh, simultaneously some uh, robots that are better at classification would then the information from the detection uh, robots would be provided to the uh, classification robots and they can come and classify the uh, type of mine or something So, I think I can give a little more addition to your answer. That is that. So, for example, let's say we are trying to uh, survey a underwater area, a specific area, and we have a set of few underwater vehicles, and let's say we have a couple of surface vehicles. Then the thing is that there is a difference in capability. So, the moment you go underwater, there is no GPS available, but the moment you are on the surface, you can get precise location. so the node which is on the surface let's say the autonomous surface vehicle can act as a point which transfers its information to the robots inside right mm -hmm. so they can try to localize themselves with respect to the on, uh, surface vehicle and they will be able to position themselves more precisely than when the surface vehicle was not present mm -hmm. the surface vehicle can provide a gps but it really can't go under water and do any survey mm -hmm. whereas the underwater vehicle can go and do a survey but it cannot have a gps of its own by declustering the two you are now taking advantage of the fact that one fellow is good at localization the other fellow is good at surveying we are getting the best of the two worlds by doing that sensor management so mm -hmm. we are We, are, we now have vehicles which have different capabilities, and we are managing them in such a way. And those vehicles with their sensors are equipped in such a way that we are trying to leverage the maximum out of them. And that's kind of what sensor management is trying to really hint at, right? Yes, sir. All right. Okay. So I, uh, I also had one doubt: like uh, sensor fusion and sensor management, uh, like are they very different from each other? So yes, are, they are. they are different from each other because see, yes yeah go ahead complete your question uh, 
uh, in sensor fusion uh, like we are we are uh, taking data from different sensors and we are obtaining most out of the data right this is what yeah, is done so, so sensor fusion you can think of it as suppose that i have a surface vehicle which is equipped with an imu and a gps okay so i don't know so from my sensors i really can't measure the velocities for the craft in any manner none of my sensors can measure velocity directly yes. right yes because imu measures accelerations gps give me precise positions but none of them give me actual velocities but yes. if i am able to use that information and fuse it together using what is called as kalman filters or using any other filters like a particle filter or any other filter for that matter you're trying to estimate what is the best estimate of my velocity at the current time instant that qualifies as what is called as a sensor fusion sensor management is slightly different sensor fusion is trying to maximize the information collected through multiple channels to reconstruct where is your current location and what is your positions what are your velocities but sensor management is more of an optimization problem you're thinking in the sense of say suppose my uh, i'm surveying a particular region of interest and i find that the target which i was looking for is at one corner of it then i might want to move my autonomous surface vehicle closer to that region so that i can localize my underwater vehicles better right it's more of an optimization problem okay. where you're trying to see how best to position my sensors or heterogeneous ses- set of vehicles such that i can get the maximum probability of detection of my target okay 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 so it's not really doing any fusion at that point yes the fusion part is also there where you are having a collaborative autonomy that, so the the i can understand why the line is a little thin between the two of them but the primary difference between them is one is an optimization problem whereas the other is trying to reconstruct your exact locations okay sir all right any other queries okay let's go ahead wallow uh, so the there are two strategies for this sensor management and one is the mission driven approach and the another one is the information driven approach uh, in the next slide we will see details about this yeah uh, so the first approach is the mission driven strategy and in this the sensor actions are based on the mission performance metrics so these metrics could be uh, maximizing the probability of detection of the target or creating appropriate tracks over uh, multiple platforms that that are giving the data then the optimization for this uh, step could be uh, using the like by minimizing the expected value of cost function uh, this cost function depends on the target state and our actions uh, that we will see and uh, yeah another way to do it would be to minimize the covariance and of the predicted posterior distribution of the probability of uh, of a state of interest uh, for a given particular sensor policy so in this the the first type uh, case where the we are minimizing the expected value of the cost what we are doing is that uh, for a particular target state uh, we are checking over all the possible actions u so capital u and uh, we are choosing that action which will lead to minimum expected value of the cost uh, this cost is uh, with a al- consideration of the mission performance metrics and i'm going to stop you right there wallah mm-hmm. so when you say an expected value what does that mean so like uh, uh so this will have a, cost will have a stochastic component as well as a, a deterministic component so for if you are taking about talking about the stochastic component then the probability of that into the cost of that so what is x and what is u here uh, x is the the target state that we want to achieve 
and use the action that we can take our available options for actions x is the target state hmm. what does that mean uh so like uh so we are trying to uh, achieve some target state i would say okay. no, i think i think what you mean there is that x is the most probable position or you, where you think the so let's say you're covering an area for mine countermeasures operation mm -hmm. let's take that as an example okay mm -hmm. so there are a certain mines laid out in a particular region and your task of your underwater robots is to figure out where precisely they are and then the next step would be to let's say diffuse them so the first step is to detect where they are right mm. so we want to figure out where is the location of the mine mm -hmm. okay what is our current estimate of the location of the mine is what we will call as x mm -hmm. okay and the action would be should i move to the left or should i move to the right should i move to the top should i move to the bottom these would be what would be called as actions mm -hmm. okay and it is a unknown quantity because the x is a unknown quantity to begin with we don't know where the target is to begin with hmm. so when we are measuring things from our sensors we'll get some estimate and that estimate will always be statistical in nature what i mean by that is i will say that it lies between 4 meters and 4.5 meters from me with a probability of 95% Mm -hmm. right so you you have a gaussian distribution of the probability distribution for where the target is it is somewhere between 4 and 4.5 meters with 95% probability mm -hmm. or 95% confidence i won't say 95% probability the right word is 95% confidence okay so that is the uncertain probability distribution over which you are taking the expectation Okay. Uh, okay. So the confidence case, what we will be doing is like then uh, we are uh, we will we will be predicting uh, whether moving this uh, moving uh, like applying a particular policy would uh, what would happen to the probability distribution after that. Correct. So that there, what you are looking at is let us say that you are looking at a. I, I'll let's take a simplified example for now. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh let's say that i have a mine i just want to know x y and z direction where it is mm -hmm. okay so when i start to measure it from a, one of my autonomous robots and i get a bearing and a contact okay which means that i have a range mm -hmm. and i have a direction in which how far away it is from me mm -hmm. this information will be having some stochastic nature associated with it so i may say that Uh, okay it lies somewhere between 4 and 4.5 meters from me at an angle somewhere between 35 degrees to 37 degrees let's say mm. right so those are the uncertainties which you're capturing in your model so your probability distribution is saying that okay in x y and z i have so much standard deviations and in the angles i have so much standard deviations right over that you are taking the expected value and then you are trying to minimize that value mm -hmm. so that probability distribution in essence is a conditional probability distribution what does mm -hmm. that mean that it is not absolute value of the probability distribution of x because you don't know that to mm -hmm. begin if you knew that i already knew where the target was mm -hmm. here i am looking at what i am measuring from my sensors and predicting what my probability distribution is based on those measurements so it is conditional on those measurements now when i talk about covariance matrix your position in this particular example has three components x y and z right so which means if it's a gaussian distribution in the three directions they'll not be independent of each other they might be actually be correlated mm -hmm. so which is why you'll have a covariance matrix associated with that probability distribution so a single gaussian distribution has a mean and a standard deviation but when you look at multi normal distribution you will have a mean vector and a covariance matrix mm. which will govern the probability distribution so one way to is to try to figure out what is minimize this expected value of the cost the other way is to look at the covariance matrix and say that i want to 
minimize the diagonal of that co covariance matrix or I want to minimize the determinant of that covariance matrix. So those are the different metrics on which these mission performance is uh, ascertained on. So you kind of determine how well the mission has performed based on these metrics. See, so far when we talked about that it's an optimization, you have to define an objective function and that is what you're in essence doing here. Hmm. Okay? Yes, sir. All right. Any other comments or anything else you, uh, anybody else wants to add? No? All right, let's proceed further. Yeah, uh, so now we look at the other uh, way of uh, other strategy that we can employ for the data driven approach. And that is the information driven strategy. So in this uh, uh, strategy, huh, the sensor actions uh, are with the goal of maximizing the information gain. So instead of the action being uh, driven by the certain mission performance metrics, uh, it's our goal is to uh, maximize the information that we are gaining. So using the information gain, uh, the advantage here is that uh, in case of uh, objectives, in case of changing objectives, uh, uh, so the mission driven approach would not be uh, suitable for that. So uh, this approach will uh, take ta tackle both of uh, if even if the objective itself is changing. So uh, how is this uh, information gain measured? So there are certain measures for that. So one is the Fisher information matrix, uh, one is the entropy and one is the mutual information. And uh, the Fisher information is uh, defined as this uh, covariance of a score function. Uh, this score function is like the uh, gradient of log likelihood of uh, uh, probability distribution of the target state uh, given some set of parameters uh, our, that we will be tweaking to uh, you know, in order to ensure that the Fisher information is maximized and our uncertainty, uh, that is a measure of uh, how much information we have gained. And then the next is the entropy. So in uh, the advantage of using entropy uh, is that uh, it quantifies areas of probabilities and uh, as opposed to in Fisher information where we are, uh, our information is uh, just localized, like uh, uh, it will be including a mean and uh, uncertainty around that mean position, but uh, that is not the case in entropy. So entropy or rather the conditional entropy here uh, is the measure of how much additional information is needed to infer the exact location of the uh, exact value of from the estimate. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, the other last measure is the mutual information. Uh, opposed, like in entropy, we are uh, looking at how much extra information we are needing. Uh, in mutual information, we are uh, looking at uh, how much uh, information is already in common. So the mutual information between the target state and the sensor configuration uh, will be checked. Uh, and uh, that is to be maximized. Okay. Yeah, this is the formula for that. Uh, H is the entropy here, and H of X given by is the conditional entropy. So, uh, yeah. Uh, uh, independently of the cost function, uh, one key uh, issue for AUVs is the planning horizon over which uh, the optimization will be based. So there are two approaches or strategies here. Uh, one is the myopic strategy or, and the other is the non-myopic strategy. In myopic strategy, uh, the only the immediate next action is considered. So we will take that action which leads to uh, minimum cost in just the next step. And uh, in non-myopic strategy, uh, multiple steps into the future are considered. So 
the immediate next action may not be the one that leads to lower cost, but uh, further down the line, this will lead to better results is the idea. So uh, non-myopic policies uh, evaluate each available action by considering its impact on the cost function uh, integrated over the uh, future set of actions. Uh, the key parameter here to be selected is the uh, number of prediction steps uh, into the future that the algorithm will be looking at. Uh, and this, this is the paper. Yeah. So uh, here the, they have done an experimental, de experimental demonstration of the non-myopic strategy. So uh, I'll first describe the setup of their experiment. Uh, so what they are using a bi-static sonar system. So the transmitter of the sonar and the receiver are not at the same position here. And uh, I think I should. So uh, here, uh, this red uh, line here shown is the uh, target that they want to track. And this is the source uh, of the sonar and uh, it will be transmitting sonar or uh, acoustic waves and they'll be reflected off and this uh, sensor array uh, that is being told by the AUV will uh, will be the receiver end of the uh, sonar system and this uh, in this experiment what they did is that uh, they have in, uh, included a non-myopic uh, strategy and uh, the AUV uh, is supposed to uh, predict the track of the target and uh, this dotted green is showing the uh, track that it is predicting about uh, uh, of this target and this uh, race track direction that they are saying is the uh, current uh, the heading that the AUV was on when the experiment itself started and here are the results that uh, for their experiment so what is what they are showing on the y axis is the uh, error of the uh, estimate bit estimated uh, location of the target and the actual location of the target and uh, on the x axis we have the ping number that is uh, how many pings have passed uh, and the robot uh, the uv uh, which was uh, detecting it, it turned itself uh, so that uh, eventually its error for the uh, location of the target was lesser than what it had been if the UV had gone straight. Uh, that is what they they, uh, they, they proposed data. Fantastic example. So you clearly see here that it deviated from its original path. And by doing so, it has actually minimized the localization error of the uh, the trace of the localization error matrix, hmm. right? So did they also mention what was the optimization or what was the cost in this study? Uh, like, uh, I didn't go much deep into the algorithm that they used. Uh, okay. I didn't understand some stuff. Uh, okay. I looked at the uh, example, like the experimental setup and the, what that uh, is signifying. Yes. Okay, I think we do. We should definitely try to take a look back at a later point and yes. see what was the details of this experiment. Yes. Okay. Uh, yeah. So, yeah uh, uh, another idea in the autonomy is that uh, about the reactive and deliberative actions. So. Uh, so so reactive strategies uh, are employed for. Uh, like uh, in cases where, uh, say, the obstacle detection, some uncertain, uh, some uncertainty in the environment, and uh, you are supposed to react to that. So this is employed as a set of behaviors that are pre-built into the robot, uh, and uh, these are not dependent on the world model. And uh, whatever the robot sees in front of it, uh, in response to that, it will uh, uh, employ that behavior, and. Uh, these strategies are computationally inexpensive. That uh, it's just like a program that is supposed to run uh, if the robot inter like detects a target in front of it and it has to move. 
uh, in contrast to that, uh, we have the deliberative architecture where uh, the near term goals and the long term goals are balanced. And uh, so it could be something like uh, even though you want to uh, avoid the obstacle, you will choose that way, which will eventually lead to uh, fast or say, uh, say the goal is to reach faster to the particular target past the obstacle. So it will choose that way, which will uh, it will uh, think about the future of the uh, future actions also. So this is a bit computationally expensive and uh, like sometimes it might lead to delayed actions. Uh, so the next approach that mixes be both of these is the hybrid approach. Uh, in this approach, uh, the there is a slow upper deliberative layer and there is also a lower reactive layer. And uh, an application for this is the is in the nested atomic concept uh, with Moos IVP. And Aditya will discuss about the uh, about in details about the nested autonomy and the software Moos IVP. <clears throat> yes. Can we go to the next? Yes. So we'll discuss first about uh, nested autonomy. So in practical scenario, we see that all these missions, the surveillance missions, are. Uh, typically long term and large scale missions which means that they meaning that they last from several days to several weeks and the problem is that we cannot use a single man unmanned platform you cannot use a single platform because it will take so much time and that is not feasible so multiple platforms working collaboratively together will be uh, might be a solution to this problem so but there is one problem which arises that we cannot use similar type of platforms. We discussed this earlier that there will be heterogeneous platforms. So this this will effectively solve this problem. Uh, like they will have different sensing capabilities, different processing capabilities, and they will have different communicating capabilities as well. So we can use a particular node for a different mission, and uh, they will be specialized for doing different tasks. So this way we can effectively solve them. Uh, we can effectively solve this problem. So nested autonomy, it is an approach to implement a system of these unmanned heterogeneous platforms for large scale missions. So the main goal is to use the heterogeneous platforms using the unified platform independent autonomy architecture, which means that these heterogeneous robots, they will be integrated together using a uh, same similar kind of software. And Moose IVP is uh, one example, which I will be discussing in the next slide. So next one, mm -hmm. oh, this. So Moose IVP, this was a software developed at MIT and the full form of this is mission oriented operating suit interval program. So the key feature being its compatibility with heterogeneous platforms. So it allows for a scalable nesting of unmanned vehicles to, far, to carry out large scale missions. Uh, even when the, the platforms that we are working with are heterogeneous, they have different capabilities. Even though they are uh, collectively brought together Created on a single unified architecture. So, Moose IP uh, consists of two distinct open source uh, software projects. Uh, you can see in the left, it is one is Moose and another is IVP Helm. So, Moose is a open source C++ model. Uh, is a set of open source C++ models, and it has a publisher and subscriber architecture for the robotic platform. So, this uh, provides a higher level of autonomy. And uh, as you can see in the image, it, it has a star-like topology, like uh, there are uh, there are there are several most applications run together, and they will be communicating to each other uh, through the Moose DB via, via publish and subscriber architecture. If we if we compare this with ROS, it is like uh, multiple nodes communicating to each other through ROS topics by publishing and subscribing messages. It is something like that. And Moose DB here would like a topic. So. And, and you can see that uh, one one uh, application here is IVP Helm. So IVP Helm, the key feature of this application, it is a behavioral based architecture. Uh, so this is based on uh, multi-object multi optimization, which means that uh, optimal decisions will be taken in the presence of multiple conflicting objectives as well. So there will be different objectives and uh, uh, the optimal decision will be chosen by solving the conflicting objectives. So uh, it 
in the right figure in the right diagram you can see that the ivp it is subscribing to the moose db and it is the information and that information am i audible yes my network yeah yeah you're audible i don't know so much people okay i'm seeing anything uh we can hear audible actually i can okay okay <laughs> so uh yes so the ivp in the right diagram we can see the ivp it it subscribes to moose db for information and this information is passed to the ivp behavior module so this behavior side is in software models dedicated for a particular aspect of uh, overall vehicle autonomy so there are multiple uh, in in the diagram you can see there are multiple behaviors and at a time some of those behaviors will be activated so output of this behavior will be iv objective function and multiple behaviors which may be active at that time they will be creating their objective functions and each of those will be competing for the influence of a vehicle so the ivp solver will be used to uh, solve those behaviors to uh, uh, to gain to get a final action and that will be passed to most tv so the ivp solver uses some set of algorithms to to solve those ivp objective functions and then from that single best action is created and it is passed to the most db and most db will then use it for uh, for the uh, uh, for the decisions like it will take higher level uh, decisions for the so for the overall platform so this is about the most ivp the software and yes next if next one will explain about cooperative approaches Yeah, I think uh, before uh, you take on Vala, uh, can you go back to the previous slide? Okay, so uh, where is the nested autonomy coming into picture here? Uh, here, uh, the nested autonomy means like uh, there will be heterogeneous uh, nodes in our network, and all of them has to be all of them have to be integrated together so that they will work using a single software platform. using a single software architecture and that is uh, uh, solved by a moose ivp so it does not require that all of the nodes have to be same different kind of nodes can work with this correct but that still doesn't explain the nested autonomy part isn't it nested means one inside the other isn't it usually mm. yes uh, <coughs> okay i'll tell you where it comes in so you if you go back one more slide previously you saw that deliberative versus reactive correct so there is a reactive behavior which means let's say that i am coming up on a collision with another obstacle then i have to react quickly to get away from it i have to immediately react to try to get away from the obstacle whereas a deliberative architecture is basically looking at what should be my general path towards my target right so there is a com competition between the two of them and that's what moose is trying to go so if you go back to the moose slide you will understand this that while the moose part is doing the deliberative part of the autonomy there is a reactive part of the autonomy which can locally take control when the situation warrants so i may be headed towards my goal of the obstacle in between and then i get too close to my obstacle the ivp part takes over so the autonomy actually is kind of taken over by the ivp part because more important for the vehicle to be safe rather than to start pursuing a goal which may be really dangerous so there is a com competition between the two and the control goes from one to the other whereas in reality the moose is the one which is planning the top level part and it's only the underlying reactive behavior which is coming into picture from the ivp so that is how it is nested so the ivp is nested inside of the moose that it suddenly takes control when it sees a reactive behavior that i am getting close to an obstacle being an example that's only one example of it okay that's what i kind of wanted to convey all right let's move forward Uh, sir so is it like the most db 
is more of like a global path planning sort Correct. of thing. So you can think and, of it as a what you call a guidance mechanism, the CBP okay. guidance mechanism, whereas the IVP Sol or IVP Helm is a reactive fellow. It's like, oh no, I I really need to do something right now to avoid a dangerous situation, which can suddenly take over the control. Right. So if I want to kind of compare it with, uh, you know, like uh, when a car is moving on a road, so hmm. it the destination, the path to the destination, may be like planned by most people, and if I want to like there is a car in front of me when i'm traveling and if i want to change the lane in that case iv ivp helm sort of comes into place it like that uh yes you can think of it like that i would probably put the example as i want to change lanes and i decide to start moving that way and i suddenly observe there is somebody in the lane over yeah then what do i do that is the reactive strategy okay okay good Uh, I, I would like to say that this software is uh, more typically used for marine applications only, not uh, on terrestrial applications. Yeah. Yes, most IVP is particularly for marine applications, and we are even considering using this in our group at a later point and see whether this will lead to some success. So, Avanish, note to you to keep a track of this a little bit. Okay, sir. Yeah. Uh, so now we will look at the cooperative planning. Uh, about so we saw that uh, there are several challenges uh, in the under. Yeah. Uh, so we saw that uh, there are several challenges uh, for the autonomous network and. Uh, some of the, them will be like uh, the being uh, low communication bandwidth uh, for communication between the robots in the network and an occasional loss of the communication uh, between the networks and also the network security. And another key challenge is the planning of or the task allocation challenge for uh, the group of uh, autonomous AUVs. So, uh, We'll see a brief overview of some of the cooperative planning approaches, uh, which aim to overcome the challenges of uncertain communication and optimal task allocation problems. Uh, for these approaches, uh, distributed policies are important as the communication loss could occur at any time. And the uh, robots should be capable of uh, autonomously taking uh, the local, locally most optimal decision. So uh, this has application in oceanography and surveillance. I think you want to explain a little bit more of what is distributed policy because some of them might not be aware. Uh, so, uh, like, uh, we are talking about a group of uh, uh, vehicles, not just one robot node. And uh, a distributed policy would be uh, something like uh, each node has its own uh, intentions. Uh, about what it it, it has on its uh, its own uh, sort of like brain to carry out its uh, tasks and there is a uh, the system as a whole has its uh, has a goal that it has to achieve so distributed in the sense each of the nodes has its own uh, ideas about what it should be doing. Correct. So the command doesn't come from all the way from the command center all the time. The robots are free to choose or they determine it on their own, sometimes with incomplete information too. Mm. And that's why the locally optimal decision comes into the picture. All right. So uh, as we have seen that uh, there are heterogeneous platforms uh, and there can be homogeneous platforms also like uh, which will have same capability. And heterogeneous platforms are those which have uh, different capabilities, like uh, in terms of uh, communication bandwidth and sensor equipment and so on. So uh, for the homogeneous approaches, there are certain uh, approaches that they have used uh, for 
uh, cooperative planning and uh, for heterogeneous uh, so they, these are the approaches that they have discussed uh, like i don't have much information about these but uh, just an overview of uh, what these approaches would mean uh, so uh, one thing that uh, i'd like to discuss in the heterogeneous platforms is that uh, the general problem here in the most general scenario the network can allocate uh, different tasks to its nodes uh, and that will depend on the, the tactical situation and it will be based on the specific environmental conditions uh, so that is the multi robot task allocation problem and this uh, task allocation is not necessarily the same throughout the uh, process like of throughout the mission so depending on the requirement new task might be created and some previously completed task might be there so uh, this is a dynamic process of uh, allocating tasks and uh, so there are these uh, utility based strategies uh, in which uh, each robot uh, uh, like they we will have a uh, specific task allocation choice and for that specific task allocation uh, we will calculate the utility so it will be something like we have two robots uh, one and two and two tasks a and b uh, robot one is assigned to task a uh, robot two is assigned to task b and uh, for we will just calculate the rewards and uh, costs for this type of allocation and we will then uh, if there are multiple robots we will uh, all will be assigned to some tasks and we will choose that allocation for which the reward minus cost uh, that is uh, this quantity is termed as the utility for which this utility is better um, maximum so that is about the utility based strategies then uh, there is the impatience and acquiescence me mechanism so what is what this is about is that uh, a robot will get impatient if it realizes that there is some task that uh, no one is uh, currently executing so it will tend to uh, go go and do that task because it is impatient and the uh, acquiescence mechanism is that uh, uh, the robot will give up on the task uh, if it finds that uh, its performance for that task is not uh, up to the expectations required uh, then there is this threshold based uh, method where uh, each robot uh, has an activation threshold for each of the tasks and uh, this this will be based on a stimulus that uh, that reflects the urgency of performing that task so if the urgency is more so that robot will do that task if the urgency is less be, lesser than this threshold value then it will uh, not do that task and then there is markov decision processes and partially observed markov decision processes uh, i don't have much details about this but uh, the idea is, is that they are useful in situations where uh, outcomes are partly random and partly under the control of the decision maker and uh, there is this last uh, strategy of auction market based so in this uh, we are sort of uh, defining a economy where uh, tasks will be the commodities and the robots will try to acquire these uh, like by doing those tasks and uh, each robot will try to maximize its own profit by like it will be doing those tasks and uh, at the same time they will if the system is designed in the correct way uh, the overall group efficiency is also increased uh, now aditya will discuss so these are some of the methodologies in which multiple robot task allocations may be achieved right so these are some methods which are existing in the literature and uh, of course many more methods are coming up and mark of decision processes particularly are nowadays leading up to what are called reinforcement learning based path planning methods and which hopefully will will start to take a look at as you both start to get a little bit more involved into this area all right uh, so lastly aditya will look at the other research areas that are currently being pursued and uh, he will also summarize the presentation as well yes so yeah so we, after uh, we read some papers uh, re related to this topic and we found out that there are certain research areas which are common commonly mentioned on, in those papers 
so first is that uh, uh, when we when we use this network to carry out a mission each robot will be allotted a, a task which we have discussed in the previous slide the mrta problem so that is one problem and another thing is the path planning so for each uh, robot node uh, the path planning is necessary so setting up uh, these problems as an optimization problem is an active research area and solving this optimization problems using deep learning techniques is uh, the research frontier is one research frontier and uh, reinforcement learning is being tested to solve this kind of problems also it is also tested for uh, solving the path planning problem as well so these uh, are some research areas that we found out and uh, finally i would summarize what uh, we discussed today so first we started with traditional process model approach and discussed about the underwater challenges then we discussed those three phases of missions uh, of the surveillance mission and then we also discussed about the different control strategies for the aus we also discussed about the reactive versus deliberative strategies in the nested autonomy concept and the software that was developed by mit the moose ivp which is uh, which which is based on the nested autonomy concept and finally we discussed about the cooperative planning approaches so yes thank you this is what we learned from those papers very good so we'll open the floor up for questions no questions come on that can't be it okay then i'll get started in the beginning in the meantime others can think through so how do you want to progress further vallabh and aditya which of the different strategies that you have at least had a briefing glance about interested you the most and which one would you like to kind of take a more detailed look at like uh, i found this particular uh, paper uh, how they experimented with uh, this non myopic strategy this i found interesting correct yes sir and i i found the the nested autonomy concept quite interesting Uh, how those two things are nested in each other and we can use heterogeneous platforms together so that was interest uh, interesting very good okay so and i'm hoping that you will start trying to take a look at in those two directions slowly and uh, we'll try to learn a little bit more but i thought that the common theme between all these different strategies is that you have to tailor the problem as an optimization problem with a specific objective function and a set of constraints and then how can the vehicle try to maximize that optimization problem and we know that machine learning or the new methodologies which have become very popular these days in achieving the sort of or being able to solve such sort of optimization problems in a really well way when you are providing them with lots and lots of data right so you can also start thinking in the direction of what sort of data would be needed from the our vehicles where we can try to employ some of these strategies or how we can think about in those lines when we are looking at multiple robot task allocations and which are data driven rather than mission driven but also sir sir uh, the asv that we are developing uh, hmm. so can we use some of this ideas in our asv so there this also might be one way to go absolutely. forward absolutely that is the whole point of this whole exercise i want you to be able to use your strategies experiment with them on our asv and try to see whether these strategies are successful to what extent they are successful how much training they require so it's it's a quite a challenging problem and yes definitely all right so like for starting like uh, we can do this uh, uh, like uh, in a simulated environment we can try some of these uh, optimizations 
very good point you bring up. I think the good way to go about this is through what is called as Gazebo. Uh, it's a simulation software which is available in the ROS framework or it kind of does interact with the ROS framework. It's good to try to set up a simulation in that. Uh, and I think for there is already a marine vehicle called the Kingfisher ASV for which there is a sample file which is already set up. So the question becomes, can we tweak it to mimic the dynamics of the KCS ship and then try to experiment with it on the simulation platform and then eventually transfer that whatever we are doing on the simulated platform to the real vehicle and start seeing some interesting characteristics and interesting phenomenon come up. Yes, sir. All right. Any other questions from others? Come on, this is now starting to feel like a, what do you call, an industrial seminar. I don't want it to be like that. You're all friends with each other. It can't be that none of you have any questions. Manoranjan, any quick thoughts? So I, I was actually kind of thinking about this most IDP software. So uh, we, you, you told that it was like mostly used in underwater applications, right? So like what kind of special features does it have to support these like, uh, unlike ROS, like uh, how is it different and similar to ROS? Any idea about that? Uh, like actually, uh, the I'm not uh, very sure, but uh, the Moose IVP came before ROS. Like, uh, ah, okay. yes, uh, Moose IVP was uh, in uh, developed in 2001. Sorry, the Moose yeah. part was developed in 2001, and the IVP part was developed in 2004. I didn't mention that yeah. there. And ROS uh, was uh, developed in 2007. So. Yeah. So it's both of them are what you call as meta operating systems. So I can kind of throw some light on that. So both ROS and Moose IVP can uh, be thought of or construed as meta operating systems. So they work over and over the Linux operating system, which you do have. And Moose can actually even be uh, translated to other ways as well. I think it is Linux based to my knowledge that it will work mostly on Linux based very well, but I think there should not be any problem to go for Windows based systems as well. ROS on the other hand has been traditionally more looking at a Linux based operating system and ROS only recently it has been trying to move towards the Windows based applications. Uh, the idea primarily is that this Moose IVP application has had a, has a tremendous amount of industrial exposure as compared to ROS. Okay. particularly in the marine autonomy sector. So Mike Benjamin, who is the author of the IVP Helm part, uh, he has been the, one of the main, major proponents at MIT for this Moose IVP program. And they have been delivering this for various industrial applications or various uh, surveying applications in the maritime sector for a long time. So it has a rich experience from which it has already learned which Ross cannot still boast of, at least in the maritime sector. So there may be some, uh, what you call experience learned lessons, which can be borrowed from Ross, I believe, uh, from Moose IVP. And we may probably be able to kind of amalgamate the two at some point and be able to achieve a synergy. So I, I think Ross hasn't evolved so much yet. Like I, I came across that not it's not very much uh, used in the industry as of now. So maybe uh, and I I heard like some of the security features in Ross are not very. I mean, with the coming of Ross too, they are probably trying to fix it up. But yeah, it makes sense. Like most IVP. Uh, is was in the industry. So. I, I'm sure that probably ROS will catch up 
quite a bit because it's an open source platform and it has a large yeah. user base. Yeah. But uh, I believe that there might be some lessons which we may be able to borrow from those. Okay. All right, Abhinish, any comments? Um, no, sir. It's okay. I, 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 I quite like these things are new to me, so it's okay. Fine. Okay. All right. So, but uh, I would like you to kind of do keep an eye over the Moose IVP because we might be interested in moving that way quite quickly. Um, point out the way. Yes. Anybody else? Shut up. Also, for me. All right, if that's the case, if there are no more questions, let me stop recording.